written by the German monk Werner Bolling in the early 1470s. The fasciculus was a reference volume, an encyclopedia of history that incorporated both religious and secular historical threats. As such, it is an extraordinary example of the early modern perspective on world history. The book is also significant in the history of printing and particularly illustration. The fasciculus presents the history of the world diagrammatically, with a central timeline running throughout and floating blocks of text clustered around circles that surround the names of important historical figures. This arrangement was intended, in Rollerwick's own words, quote, for the use of daily memory, which men have put together in writing, separating the value from, valuable from the useless, lest the reader be drowned in a headlong rush in a world full of darkness, unquote. This deliberate arrangement of the page for the benefit of the reader is a fascinating insight into the relationship between author, printer, and reader in the late 15th century. And the book itself is our best remaining evidence of how that relationship may have functioned. This is the first page, the first edition of the Cyclus, printed in the author's home city of Cologne in 1474 by Arnold Terhern. Six editions followed Terhern's in the book's first five years in print, of which this presentation is concerned with those by Belzner, 1475, Brock in 1477, Walsh in 1479, and Quintel also in 1479. These different versions of the illustration of the Tower of Babel found in those editions give a sense of the changes in the book's illustration program over time. And these editions all had around the same number of illustrations, about 5 to 10. The German printer, Erich Rotto, produced four signed editions of Cyclist during his 10 years of events from 1476 to 1486. And there's a marked visual difference between Rathold's editions and those that preceded them in the book's publication history. Erica Rathold's first signed edition in 1480 drastically changed both the appearance of the book and the reader's experience of it by including a staggering 56 images, which he then increased to 68 images in his second edition of 1481. This explosion of imagery completely changed the visual layout of the cyclus. The illustration program in Rathold's 1480 edition did not, however, appear out of thin air. In 1924, librarian and bibliographer Margaret B. Stilwell elucidated the relationship between these editions in her genealogical survey of the fasciculus before 1480. Her work remains the most in-depth analysis of the book and is widely cited. The results of her study are laid out in this simple family tree style table. Her paper, however, stops just short of Rathbold's first signed edition. Thus, I have created an updated version of the table to reflect my own research. As you can see from this table, I determined some relationships between these editions that Stilwell, working only with textual continuity, does not know. The 1477 inspired edition by Peter Drop is visually related to Belden's 1475 Lumen edition. And the 1479 Lumen edition by Fentel is related to Walsh's Venetian edition of the same year. Since the Veltner and the Watch are clearly related to Rathold's first 1480 edition textually, this new visual evidence links the Graf and the Quintel to Rathold's editions also. I will demonstrate these relationships by examining certain key illustrations. The 1474 first edition by Arnold Terhernen is the first instance of the orderly, rational graphic layout that became the default for the Cyclist, as we saw earlier on its first page. Bibliographer A.G.W. Murray identified four separate issues within this single edition. Stillwell's table, however, distinguishes only between copies with a nine-leaf index and those with an eight-leaf index. Of key importance here is the fact that one issue with the eight-leaf index does not have Terhernan's remarkable depiction of his home city, shown here. The cathedral is what makes this instantly identifiable as Cologne. It's the most recognizable building in the city and indeed one of the most recognizable in all of Germany. And as this image from 1856 shows, Turner's depiction was quite accurate and would have been identifiable even centuries later. Stillwell shows two distinct branches of influence coming from the AP index issues. One leads to the Walsh's 1479 edition. The Walsh is widely acknowledged as Rattle's main, if not only, source for his editions, and it's even been suggested that Rattle may have worked uncredited on the publication. The Veltner was undoubtedly a textual source for Walsh. Of the 20 new paragraphs added by Veltner to his edition, Walsh reproduces 19. Thus, the textual lineage is clear. Illustratively, however, there's a slight ripple in this genealogy. 
Feldner's illustration on the page that mentions the founding of Cologne is a generic cityscape, whereas Walsh's has two towers in the top right that look very much like the Cologne Cathedral's distinctive architecture. Even though Walsh repeats this woodblock elsewhere in his book, the towers are so distinctive that their appearance at this particular point is worthy of note. This could simply be chalked up to Walsh or a craftsman at his press having greater familiarity with Cologne than Belden or his craftsman, since Walsh was a German where Belden or lived in Western Belden. It could also have a reproof of Stilwell's assertion that printers of this particular book, quote, frequently made use of more than one edition in building up their copy, unquote. And specifically, I would add their illustrations. The next edition that I believe fits into the genealogy of Rachel's work is Peter Drauss of 1477, printed at Speyer, Germany. Stilwell identifies this edition as something of an outlier. Assessing the illustrations, however, paints a different genealogical picture. Drauss' portrayal of Noah's Ark above is an almost exact copy of Dogman's below, except it does not have water underneath it. In addition, the image has been flipped, such that the protruding portion of the deck is on the right instead of on the left as it is in Belden's. If a craftsman had copied the design from Belden's edition directly onto the wood block for cutting, the resulting block would have printed with this reversed orientation. Both Belden's and Rack's arcs are markedly different from Terhernan's, and so it seems Rack could not have been copied from Terhernan's edition when it comes to his imagery. This hypothesis is borne out by the cityscape illustrations in Rack's edition, which share key features with Belden's. Each printer employs four cityscape woodblocks, one in the other than the other three, and one showing the ruined city, with some of the same architectural details and building shapes. In these slides, you see Belgian cityscapes on the left and rocks on the right. And while there are obvious stylistic differences, the basic form of the city views is the same. In addition, Rock's holy temple image is the only other one to depict an interior view, even though the architectural style is different from Belgian's. The relationship between Drach and Belden's illustrations provides proof for my claim that the printers of the Pasiklis used multiple editions to build up not only their textual content, but also their illustration programs. The illustration of the Holy Temple in Walsh's edition also points to a more complex genealogy than Stilwell provides. Walsh's temple is depicted quite differently from Belden's and Drach's. Rather than an interior view of a room edged with columns, the round temple building is shown from the exterior in a courtyard. This is how Brockville portrays the temple as well. Interestingly, this building is very similar in structure to the temple depicted in another edition of 1479, printed by Heinrich Quintel in Cologne. According to Stilwell's genealogy, these two editions are not related, except for having a common ancestor in 1474 Terhernan. Yet Terhernan's edition does not include a temple image in any of the four issues. If Walsh was drawn purely from Belden or Drock's editions, why would he have differed so markedly in his depiction of the temple? Perhaps Walsh also saw or consulted Quintel's edition, or perhaps they drew from the same source image. Either way, this image adds to the complication of the visual lineage of Rachel's editions and the genealogy of the Cyclas as a whole. While the Pasiklis appears esoteric and practically impenetrable to the modern reader at first glance, it is clear from its multiple reprintings that the Renaissance reader found much to recommend it. The editions of Erhard Rachtel provided a new visual benchmark, a changed expectation of what the printed page could or even should look like. Later printers' adoption of Rachtel's designs reflect this. Rachtel undoubtedly changed the reader's experience of the Pasiklis, and thus the experience of history that it provided. As a snapshot of how early modern Europe saw itself and its ancestry, the Pasiklis is a microcosm of the society by which it was used, and thus provides an important view into that society. The visual lineage of the editions by Erhard Rachtel show the development not just of the Pasiklis, but also of textual experience, demonstrating how illustrations were able to, in rolling words, enrich and illuminate.